Okay, welcome back everyone. I've uh, just started the recording of this uh, continuing session, the second lecture. Okay, let's pick up from where we paused uh, before the break. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, so uh, we spoke about the fact that the blood speaks. So in the spiritual realm, when we talk about the blood, it's very, very powerful. And the blood of Jesus speaks of better things. It's, it's announcing of a new covenant with God. It's announcing um, the completed work of eternal redemption uh, that we have. Uh, and it's announcing that our sins have been forgiven, the debt's been cleared. So the blood is very powerful. Uh, we looked at Colossians 1, 13 and 14 in detail a little earlier on. Uh, we talked about the fact that we are delivered from Satan's dominion. Right? So this truth has to be settled in our hearts that Satan has no right over us, no claim over us, no access to us because we are in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now we know he's going to violate, try and violate that. You know, if we know that he's going to try and, you know, uh, in the natural, because this this is spiritual reality and he's going to try to affect us through the natural. We are living in a natural world and he's going to try to work against us in, in the natural world. But this truth, spiritual truth, we will bring to bear in our natural life here on earth. And we will talk about that. So as part of this, uh, as part of our redemption, we must understand we are God's property, right? We are 100% God's property. Um, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20, it tells us you were bought at a price. So that's redemption. We were bought at a price. In the same picture that we talked about, the picture of redemption. Uh, Jesus offered himself as a ransom and he purchased our pre uh, us out of being in subjection to the devil. So we are bought. So when he paid the ransom for us, what happened? We became his property. So whose property are you? You're God's property. You're the property, you and I, we are property of the one who paid the ransom. So we were bought at a price. We are now God's, God's purchased possession. Therefore, our goal is to glorify God in our body, in our spirit, that means every part of our being, which are God's. That means every part of us, spirit, soul, and body, belongs to God. Okay? So you and I have a right to say, I am God's property, spirit, soul, and body. By the means, my entire being belongs to God. And Satan has no right to trespass on God's property, spirit, soul, and body. Every part of me is God's property. Right? And uh, this, this whole uh, uh, idea or this truth uh, is, is uh, uh, repeated here. The song in the book of Revelation says, you have redeemed us to God by your blood. You know, that means you have purchased us to God. You redeemed us to God. You have purchased us to God by your blood. So we are God's property. We belong to God. So now what we want to do is we want to just kind of break it down and say, okay, what are we redeemed from? So that we can, you know, very specifically say, look, I'm, I'm not enslaved by that. I'm free from it. And I can walk free from it, right? So, uh, and how do we do that? We, we, we should be able to finish that uh, in this lecture. So we are redeemed from the curse of the law. So not only are we redeemed from, so we already mentioned the first thing is we are delivered from Satan's dominion. So that's the first thing. We are redeemed. We are delivered from Satan's dominion. Satan has no control over you and me. And we've been taken out in our God's purchased possession. In continuation, next, we are redeemed from the curse of the law. We will look at this uh, in detail in the 
next chapter. Uh, that's lesson number eight. But what I want to um, emphasize here, or just point to here, is the law. When you talk about the law, we are referring to the entirety of the law that was given through Moses. So the law was given through Moses. And uh, that means the Ten Commandments, the religious laws, how, you know, how the people have to worship God by various sacrifices, uh, the ceremonial laws and how they would approach God, the feasts they had to keep, all of that. And uh, the community laws, meaning how they had to deal with each other, living in, uh, in the community and so on. Uh, hygiene laws, laws that dealt with, you know, what you can eat and what you cannot eat, those kinds of things. So all of that was part of the law of Moses. You know, so when you read Exodus, Leviticus, Exodus and Leviticus, and it's essentially uh, the written law, the law that was given through Moses. And the New Testament is telling us that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now, there is a play on, uh, there, there, you know, uh, well, sure, let me say this. Uh, we need to understand this in two ways. One, the law itself was a curse, meaning, and, and in what sense? Meaning, not that the law was bad, <laughs> sorry, but we couldn't keep the law. People couldn't keep the law. And so the law just brought um, an, an, a weight on the people. It, it brought a, uh, it, it was a heavy weight on the people. So in that sense, the law was a curse. But we also read about the curse of the law, uh, which means it had to do with the penalty for violating the law. So we read about this in um, Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. So if you have your Bibles, um, and I just want to point this out to you, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, um, verses 1 to uh, 14, are all the blessings of the law. Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 14. And then from verse 15, Till the very end of the chapter, which is verse 68, from verse 15 to 68, are the curses of the law. So let me just write this down in the chat. Deuteronomy. Some of you may be, may be familiar with this. Are the blessings. And... Uh, It's 15 to 68. Okay. So, the curses of the law. So, under the curses of the law, if you look at it, you read it, you will find um, everything that the uh, whole kinds of problems are listed there poverty, financial trouble, sickness. You know, problems at home, problems with the children, problems in the business, problems in relationships, uh, all kinds of things, physical problems and so on. And and, and you can read it. And uh, in fact, here, uh, uh, it talks about verse 61 says, every sickness and every plague. So Deuteronomy 28. If you look at verse 61, it says every sickness and every plague, which is not even written, you know. So sickness and plague is under the curse. It's not listed under the blessing. It's listed under the curse of the law. Right? Uh, and all kinds of things here, if you read, read through this. Um, so going back to... Galatians chapter 3, and when you look at verse 13, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. 
And what I just explained is, it must be understood in both sense. That is, one is the law itself being a curse, being too heavy for us to live under. And we will discuss that in detail in the next lesson. And also we must understand the curse of the law in the sense of what is written there in Deuteronomy 28 as under the curses of the law. Why? Because that is their outcome of not being able to keep the law. So what did Christ redeemed us from? He redeemed us from all of these things. Each and every one of these things listed in Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 to 68. Each and every one of those things. If you look at it and say, no, all these things I am free from. They have no right over me because Christ has redeemed me. He has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Right? Verses 15 to 68. And as I pointed out in verse 61, it says, Every sickness and every plague, which is not even written down here. Everything. It's part of the curse. Right? So I want, to, I want us to think about this, right? Sometimes people say, well, God, God blessed me with a sickness to teach me a lesson. And now that is not scriptural because sickness and disease is not a blessing. It's under the curse. So we don't have any right to move sickness from the curse into a blessing. No. It's listed under the curse. So leave it there. Now, of course, we will face sickness and disease, and you know we can you know learn things through the the process. But we don't make call sickness and disease a blessing. It's not a blessing. It's under the curse. We leave it there, and we say Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, right? And uh, that's repeated for us here in in Galatians four verses four and five, that Christ redeemed those of us who are under the law and instead he brings us into a place of being sons and daughters of god right? so what are we redeemed from we're redeemed from the curse of the law both the weight of the law and the curses of the law have no right over us we can stand our ground and, and you know resist those things next we are redeemed from every lawless deed titus chapter 2 verse 14 it says that Jesus, who Jesus gave himself for us, that he might redeem us. Same, same thought, you know, bring us out from being in captivity. That he might redeem us from what? From every lawless deed. That means every sinful deed. And purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So this is, again, very interesting. What did Jesus redeem us from? He redeemed us from every lawless deed. That means every sinful deed. So some people say, you know, I'm in bondage to this sin. I'm in bondage to this addiction. I, 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 cannot, I can't seem to come out of this. Well, when we understand redemption, we understand that our redemption includes freedom from every sinful deed. So he redeemed us from it. Remember earlier we read, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. So sin enslaves. But Jesus redeemed us from every sinful deed. So no sinful deed or habit or addiction can hold a believer captive. Why? Because we're redeemed from it. And instead of being enslaved to lawless deeds, we can be purified. We can live pure as his own special people who, have, who are zealous for good works. So this is another part of our redemption. We are free from every lawless deed. Both. So we've talked about three uh, f so far. First, we are redeemed from Satan's dominion or delivered from Satan's dominion. And therefore, we become God's property. Second, we are redeemed from the curse of the law, both the law itself and all the curses under it. Third, 
We are redeemed from every lawless deed, every sinful deed. So no sin can hold us or enslave us. Number fourth, we're going to fourth one now. Um, yeah, so fourth one. We are redeemed from this present evil age. Somebody could read Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 for us, please. Galatians 1, 3 to 4. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 1, 4. Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. Amen. Thank you. So, look at that. He gave himself for our sins. So Jesus offered himself on the cross for our sins. We know that. And what, what was he trying to do? That he might deliver us or set us free from this present evil age. So let me highlight this. Huh? What's happening? This present evil age. Jesus has set us free from this present evil age what does that mean you see if you if you cross reference uh, and if you go to first john chapter 5 and we look at verse uh, i think it's verse 18 first john somebody could read this for us please first john chapter 5 and uh, yeah let's read verse 19 please First John chapter five verse nineteen. Can somebody read that? We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Mm, thank you. So John is saying. The whole world. So today, today, the world is under the sway or under the influence of the wicked one. So what is this present evil age? This present evil age talks about this entire system of the world that is demonically controlled. Now, I'm not saying everything is bad, right? I'm not saying the world is a terrible place, no. And there are so many good things in the world we can enjoy. You know, you can enjoy good food, you can enjoy um, all the beautiful things that God has created, all of nature, all of beautiful things. But there is also a, the system of this world that is controlled or influenced by the wicked one, like we just read here in verse 19. And the Bible is telling us here in Galatians 1 verse 4, he, Jesus has delivered us from this present evil age, this current world system that is dominated or influenced by the devil. So we don't have to be submitted to the influence of evil that comes at us through the present world, present system. We are in the world. We have to engage with the world, of course. So we do interact with the world systems. We engage with the world systems. We are here to be salt and light. We are here to actually bring the light of God in to the darkness. So we have to go where it's dark. You know, we, do, we stay in a bright room. Well, you know, okay, that's fine, but it's not going to do much good. So we are the light. So we need to go where darkness is so that we can be light there. But as we go there, we know that this present evil age has no power over us because we are delivered from this present evil age. We are not subject to its evil influence. Well, is there darkness around us? Yes. Will uh, the enemy try to influence us? Of course. 
but we must understand we are delivered from this present evil age. And so therefore we are not subject to the influence of darkness that comes at us through the world system, through this present evil age. Right? So as we engage with the world, we interact with things of the world, the systems, though we understand it, uh, we, we engage with it, but we are not subject to it. We, we know, we are confident, we are delivered from the influence of this evil age. Um, just a couple of things more here. What are we delivered from? We are redeemed from the fear of death. Could somebody read that? Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, please. Yeah, go ahead. In as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Mm. So... The Bible is telling us here that Jesus took part in flesh and blood. That means he came like us. He became human. He shared in the same. He came on in a human body. And through his death, so he died on the cross. But what did he do, th do through his death? He destroyed the one who had the power of death, that is the devil. So what, uh, through his death, that is on the cross, Jesus destroyed the devil he rendered him powerless he he you know he crushed the devil he destroyed him and the outcomes of that one of the outcomes is he would release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime in bondage so as people, as sinners, it's quite possible that people would live in the fear of death, afraid because knowing that once they die, there's an eternity without God. And so their entire lifetime, the entire lifetime, they are subject to bondage. They're in, in, in bondage, in captivity, they held in the fear of death. But now, because Christ has destroyed Satan, we are released from this fear of death. So that's a beautiful thing. That as believers, we have no fear of death. So our lifetime is not spent in bondage or in you know in bondage to this fear of death. We are, uh, you know, while we all desire and all must desire to live out the full course of our lives, we're not afraid of death. Because we know death is only a transition and it's going to take us into the presence of God. So we are free from the fear of death. And as believers, we should not, we need not be living under fear of death. Okay, somebody has a question. Yes, son, you have a question, please. Yes, so for death, I know in terms of means like physical death, but also could that mean um, sickness? Like, what I mean sickness, like physical sickness, mental, emotional, does that apply to that also? Mm. Over here, yeah, so here he's specifically talking about the fear of death. But I think definitely, I mean, I, I haven't thought of Thought of it like that, like the way you mentioned it, but it definitely can be extended. Meaning, if I'm not afraid of death, then I don't have to be fearful of things that lead to death, which would be sickness and any kind of calamity that results in death. So, by extension, yes, it, it, we can include that as well. So we are not fearful of death 
or the things that bring us to death, which would be sickness or calamities and so on. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So let's just uh, go over a few more things here on what we are redeemed from. So we are also redeemed from generational bondages. Right? Could somebody read this for us, First Peter 1, 18 and 19, please? First Peter 1, 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Mm, thank you. So Peter is saying, knowing, so I want you to know this, that uh, you know God didn't redeem us with gold or silver, no. But he gave the precious blood of Christ, who was a lamb, like as a lamb, without blemish, without spot. So this perfect lamb. But in this verse, what's he telling us? He's saying you're redeemed from what? From your aimless conduct or way of life that was received by tradition from your fathers. So let's think about that. He says, you're redeemed. God brought you out of this. You're no longer subject to this. You're no longer you know, enslaved by this. By what? Your aimless conduct. Conduct means it's not just you know, uh, uh, okay, let me put it this way. Aimless conduct means your aimless manner of life, your way of living. that had meaning, meaningless, your way in your empty manner of life. You're set free from it, which was received by tradition from your fathers. That means your forefathers, your ancestors, all right? They lived like this. And they just passed it down, passed it down, passed it down as it comes to you. But you are free from that. Now, Peter, of course, is writing to Jewish believers. So Peter was an apostle to the Jews. He was writing to the Jewish believers who at that time had been scattered uh, after the persecution that took place in Jerusalem. Uh, uh, eight years or so after the day of Pentecost, there was a huge persecution in Jerusalem, and then they were all scattered. And, uh, you know, they, they were uh, in, in and around that region. So Peter is writing to the believers. He's writing to those who have been dispersed because of the persecution, Jewish believers. And he's saying, you know, do you see a lot of things will have, and I'm just paraphrasing this. He's telling them, look, you've, you've got a lot of things handed down to you from your forefathers that tells you how to live and what to do and what not to do and so on and so forth. But he says, you're free from all of those things. That's you are not subject to whatever has been handed down by tradition from your forefathers. So again, now I'm applying this by extension. So we understand the context that means we know, okay, what's he say, whom is he speaking to and what's he telling them? Now, you and I are not Jewish people, and uh, but if the blood of Jesus would do this for them, then the blood of Jesus would do the same for us. So whatever was handed down by tradition to us, which basically is aimless conduct, is a vain and empty way of living, it has no meaning for us things that may have come down to us from generations. It, it has no relevance to the kingdom of God. The blood of Jesus Christ sets us free. And, you know, for those of us in different cultures, different parts of the world and different cultures, we could have had different things handed down to us. You know, uh, it could be uh, lifestyles. It could be behavior patterns, uh, sometimes it could be religious beliefs, um, it could be whatever, whatever's been handed down, which doesn't fit into the God, kingdom of God, the blood of Jesus Christ sets us free. So we're not in bondage to that. 
And we can use the same thing if it comes to behaviors, you know, for example, anger or other kinds of addictions or uh, sin, the sins that have been empowered, that are demonically empowered, you know, uncleanness and so on. Things that are uh, uh, you know, Satan's foothold and, and, and he empowers those behaviors. So I'm, I'm, I'm redeemed from that. It doesn't fit into the kingdom of God. So whatever that does not fit into the kingdom of God, which has been handed down from forefathers, I am redeemed from. You and I don't have to be subject to it. And it can vary, like I said, you know, different de depending on our backgrounds, depending depending on you know where we've come from, whatever. But if it doesn't fit into the kingdom of God, you and I can take a stand and say, no, it's not going to continue in my life. The blood of Jesus Christ has redeemed me from it, set me free from it. Okay. And uh, so the the the, uh, the the part of our redemption. I just want to finish a few more thoughts here. Uh, so redemption restores us to God, or reconciles us to God, puts us in this wonderful relationship with God. Like we said, it brings us out of captivity, of being in bondage to sin and Satan, and it takes us into a beautiful relationship with God. The other side, right? So Romans 5, 11, just not only that, may we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Right? So there's an, uh, there's an atonement, and the atonement always results in reconciliation. We are restored to God. We are reconciled to God. We are made friends with God. So redemption includes our re restoration, reconciliation with God. So we go back to that original verse, the first verse that we started, 1 Corinthians 1.30, where it says, Christ is our redemption. You know, so Christ is our redemption. So when we talk about redemption, we can say Jesus Christ is my redeemer. Jesus is the one who has redeemed me. And Christ himself is my redemption. If Jesus is alive, then your redemption is valid. And Jesus indeed is alive. So your redemption indeed is completely valid. Christ is our redemption. He is my redemption, our redemption. So what must we do, right? Uh, two things. We need to say so. Psalm 107 verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. This, this declaration of our, of our, our redemption is important. When we say that we are redeemed, we can walk in our redemption. That means we are acknowledging that we know the truth of our redemption and that we are choosing to walk in that redemption. So here's where many believers uh, fail uh, to enjoy the redemption. That is, first, they don't know what their redemption is and that that it can be enjoyed here and now you can actually walk in it here and now they don't know it and secondly they don't say it let the redeemed the lord say so you need to acknowledge i am redeemed this is what god has given me this is what god has done for me satan has no place in me no claim in me so we need to say so let the redeemed of the lord say so so you are you and i must say this you know satan you have no claim over me no place in me i am god's purchased possession my spirit soul and body belong to god i'm redeemed from the curse of the law i'm redeemed from every sickness disease poverty failure anything that's listed under that curse i am redeemed from it i am redeemed from every lawless deed no sin can control me. I am redeemed from this present evil age. This, the influences of this world will not prevail over me. I am redeemed uh, from uh, every uh, manner of empty, bond, every uh, 
empty way of life, manner of life that may have been handed down from my forefathers. I am redeemed. The sins of my forefathers will not affect me. Whatever they did, which is not uh, aligned to the kingdom of God, will not affect me because I am redeemed. So, and you say, Christ himself is my redemption. So we need to say that. We need to affirm that we are the redeemed of the Lord. Right? And then the Bible teaches us, Revelation 2, 11, that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So we must have the word of our testimony. What is our word? What, what do we testify? We have to testify about the blood of the Lamb, of course. So the blood of the Lamb, remember we said earlier, the blood speaks. But now we have to do our speaking. That's our testimony, our speaking. Is aligned to the blood of the Lamb. It says they overcame him. That's Satan. If you read the preceding verse of Revelation 12, 10, it talks about Satan. So we overcome the adversary, we overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. The blood of the Lamb is already speaking. Now we speak and declare what the blood of the Lamb has done for us. And we do not love our lives under that. We are not afraid of death because Jesus has redeemed us from the fear of death. We do not live in the fear of that. You know, if we have to die for Jesus' sake, hey, we are fine. We, we are ready. But we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. So we testify to what the blood of Jesus has done for us. Testify to the blood. The blood is speaking. The blood is announcing all this. I'm just quickly reviewing. The blood is announcing that you and I are delivered from Satan's dominion. The blood is announcing that we are God's property. The blood is announcing that we are redeemed from the curse of the law, from all the curses listed there. The blood is announcing we are redeemed from every lawless deed. Uh, the blood is announcing we are redeemed from this present evil age. Uh, the blood is announcing we are free from the fear of death. Uh, the blood is announcing that we are free from generational bondages. Uh, the blood is announcing we are restored or reconciled to God. And the, you know, the Christ himself is our redemption. So what must we do? We must, we must testify to what the blood is already speaking. Right. So this truth of our redemption is a very powerful truth. So it's true. Right? Spiritually, it's true. So now we have to stand up and say, you know, I'm redeemed. Now, just, I know I'm repeating, but Satan is a trespasser. He's going to try to come and violate this. That's, that's, that's who he is. But you and I stand our ground and say, no, I am the redeemed of the Lord. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And the Bible says, that when that we overcome the devil, how? By the blood and by our testimony. So the blood has done its work. Now we have to announce by the word of our testimony what the blood of Jesus has done for us. And that's how we overcome the enemy, live victoriously uh, because of our redemption. So I'm going to pause here. I want to see if anybody has any questions uh, before we close this uh, lecture. Okay. Yes, Shani, please go ahead. Um, for Revelation 12, 11, I never understood the last part that says they did not love their lives to the death. What do they mean? I don't, I don't know what that means. Okay. So the, let me just give you a quick context. So Revelation chapter 12 um, it's a chapter, um, uh, of course, we, we know the Re book of Revelation is about the end times. So what happens in the sequence of events that's unfolding in the book of Revelation? Uh, in Revelation 11 is the midpoint of the tribulation period, seven years of tribulation. Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, talks about uh, the midpoint. That means the first three and a half years is over. It's the beginning of the second three and a half years. So in Revelation 11, it talks about the two witnesses and uh, you know who come and doing what they think. Revelation 12 
uh, talks about um, the uh, what, what Satan, what's going to happen to Satan in the second half of the tribulation. So you know, it, it begins with a picture of uh, the the woman, the man child, and the dragon. The woman is the nation of Israel. The man child is Jesus Christ. Uh, the dragon, of course, is Satan. And uh, it, it basically tells us in chapter 12 that Satan makes a final attempt. If you read the preceding verses, he makes a final attempt to get into heaven. But Michael and the archangels, they push him down. They cast him out of heaven. They're saying, like, you, you, sorry, no entry. You can't get into heaven. No access. So. Uh, uh, Revelation 12 says, Satan comes back with great vengeance on the earth, knowing his time is short. He's got just three and a half years left to do whatever he wants to do. So he's coming with great vengeance. Now, of course, on the earth, there are believers, people who have believed in Jesus since the time of the rapture. The rapture has taken place. We are three and a half years into tribulation. And there are people who believed. So it's talking about them. And they, that means believers. Okay. So Satan is coming with great vengeance. He's got, he knows his time is short. He's coming with great vengeance. But they, the believers who are there on the earth at that time, they overcome him, that is the devil, Satan. How? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto death. That means they're not afraid. So that means even if Satan is going to kill them, and if you read the end of chapter 12, many are martyred. If you go into chapter 13, you read about the Antichrist and the false prophet, where you know, then the Antichrist introduces this economic system where you cannot buy or sell except you have the mark of the beast in Revelation 13. And many people refuse the mark of the beast and they die. So basically, believers, you know, those who believe in Jesus Christ during the tribulation have a very hard time. So that's what it's talking about. They do not love their lives unto death. That means to the, to the point of death, they are willing to stand up for Jesus. Right? So the context of Revelation 12, of course, is there in the second half of the tribulation. But the essence, the truth is, we overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Okay, thank you. Yeah, got that? Okay. Yes. Okay, any other questions? All right. So did we all uh, understand this lesson on our redemption? So this is our identity and our inheritance in Christ. We are the redeemed of the Lord. You are redeemed. Okay. And you and I need to walk in our redemption. Say, God, this is our redemption blessing. Uh, this is what God has given to me as a blessing in redemption. I'm going to walk in it and, uh, and I'm going to enjoy the blessings of redemption. Okay, let's take a moment just to pray. I want to pray with us as a class. And I just want to pray that, you know, we, each one of us uh, will walk in our redemption blessings. Okay, let's just pray together. And after that, we will close. Okay. Father, we thank you for the word we have heard today. And I pray for each and every person, God, who is in this class right now. And for those who may watch this later on. Father, thank you. Your word says we are the redeemed of the Lord. And so Satan has no claim over us, no power over us. And I pray for every person here. And I announce to you, Satan, you have no right over God's property. If you have violated in any way, sickness, disease, any form of affliction, anything that does not align itself with the kingdom of God today, right now, in Jesus' name, I adjure you, devil, take your hands off of God's property. Take your hands off of God's property. In the name of Jesus, I declare that each one of God's children here will walk in the full blessings of redemption. They'll walk free from sickness and disease. They will walk in wholeness. They will walk in blessing. 
They will walk in abundance. They will walk in God's provision over their lives. They will walk in victory and authority and dominion. They will walk free from every bondage because we are the redeemed of the Lord and we say so. And Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that has redeemed us, that, that announces that we are the redeemed of the Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, everyone. Thank you for being on the class today. I know we finished about five minutes early, um, but that's okay. I'll uh, just take a few five minutes, a little extra break, and then you can proceed to your next class. God bless you. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you again Friday. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Paul. God bless you. Thank you, each one. God bless. God bless you. Thank you. God bless. Have a good day. Oh, sorry, I have a, uh, I have a question. You said that you were going to post something up over the weekend for us. Ah, uh, yes, honey. So, I'll do. A, I haven't given any assignment till now, so I will prepare an assignment and make that available in the coursework. It's just okay. Some, you know, that's like, the that's the like the midterm that's worth forty percent. Uh, thirty percent. Yeah. Thirty percent. Okay. All yeah, right. It's gonna be simple, easy. No, nothing to worry about. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Now.